hope you all had a good lunch. Um, I talk a bit about digital transformation this afternoon. So my name is Adrian Cockcroft, uh, AWS VP of Cloud Architecture Strategy. I spend a lot of my time traveling the world. I do keynotes at some of the AWS summits. And a lot of the time, I'm talking to executives, management, about how they're transforming the firms that they work at, or the government departments, or the organizations they're at. So this, is, this presentation is basically a distillation of what I've learned as I've gone around looking at the patterns. And, you know, what, and what are people doing about it? So I'll talk about the, you know, what is digital transformation, but then a little bit about the things that I find people that are blocking people from getting it done, and then the different phases that we go through, I tend to see people go through as they get to it. So first of all, uh, I, I kind of like this little approach to explaining what is this about. So old world IT, before this digital transformation thing, you managed employees at work while they were at work. You had factories, supply chain. Your sales channels involved shipping stuff. You put it in a box. You sent it to a shop or a retail, some outlet, right? And then you did your marketing by putting something on TV or in a print ad and finding out and then asking somebody else, did anyone see it? Right? It's all very indirect. So the thing that's missing here is the end customer. There is no end customer here. Everything is indirect. And the real difference for the new world is that we, we transcend these indirect uh, sort of stages and go directly to the customer. So in new world IT, we connect to employees at work, but at home, mobile. You're building mobile apps to make your employees more efficient. Your factories and supply chain are instrumented in fine detail, you know, where every part is as it moves. You see what's happening. There's a lot of just-in-time delivery and continuous supply tracking. Sales has moved online, sales and delivery, things like Amazon Prime, um, just one example. And think, let's just take an example. Let's say you make door locks. In the old world, door locks, you put them in a box, you send them to Home Depot or somewhere, and you hope you never see them again, right? If, they, if you see one again, it's because it broke. Something went wrong with it. Now, with an I IoT connected door lock, if you don't hear from it every five minutes, something's gone wrong, right? That's the transition. That's the difference. Now, you're not just putting it in a box and shipping it. You now are connected to every door lock you've ever sold, every customer that you've ever sold it to, and you're tracking all these things. And then somebody tweets something bad about your door lock um, brand, and you have to respond immediately. So, we're, so marketing is now online, social media connected. So this is the new world. If you think about what changed here, everything is now scaled completely differently. So we now have to think about how do we personalize the things we make for our employees, for our customers, for our sales channels, all of these different things. We have customer level analytics. We know exactly how the things we make are used by each individual customer, and then we can optimize for different groups of customers. That's, that's the new world. And then we have new channels that go direct to those customers. We have to manage those channels. And we're managing vastly more things. You know, not just a few more, but orders of magnitude more things. They run at much larger scale. And the rate of change is now, instead of sort of an annual product cycle, you're updating every week. You know, we see mobile apps updating every two weeks. Um, we see online services continuously updating. So the rate of change is just off the charts compared to the old world. So that's my kind of instant summary of what this digital transformation is about, as companies are struggling to deal with the realities of this new world. So what are we doing? So AWS is helping unblock this innovation and helping our, companies, uh, our customers go through digital transformation. And there's a few things that get in the way when you try to do it. So I'm going to go through these, these four areas. I'm going to talk about culture, the leadership systems and feedback, talk about the skills, how you think about training, compensation, the organizational mechanisms you put together. Uh, are, you build, are you doing projects or are you running products? And then there's a number of finance things that sneak in and can undermine you as you get into this. So we'll talk a bit about the CapEx versus OpEx and, and how to think about managing through that. 
So start off looking at culture. So how do you make decisions? Is it centralized, slow decision making? Are you running in a low trust environment? Do you have inflexible policies and processes? Maybe the systems you've got built were perfectly well optimized systems for the old world where things take a year to do anyway, but how do they work when you're changing things every day? Right? They, they, don't, they don't work for that. There's a couple of good books here. Uh, Stephen Auburn of, of AWS, he, he's been here a few years. He wrote this book. It was, it was a whole series of blog posts, but he summarized it into a book, Ahead in the Cloud. Um, I was very happy to be asked to be one of the uh, author, one of the forwards for this book. So you see my name down at the bottom along with a couple of other guys. So I'm Andy Jassy, who got him to write a forward. And it's, getting Andy to write a forward for a book is no mean feat on its own. It's, it's incredibly busy. And then um, Mark Schwartz. Mark Schwartz wrote the other book I've listed here, A Seat at the Table. This is how to be an agile CIO. So if you look at the job of a CIO, what does it entail? What are the best practices of being a CIO? And you lay them out, it's waterfall. It's all slow. It's like the best practices aren't agile. They don't get you, they get you to run a cost center more efficiently. A seat at the table is about bringing that work into the new world and how to be an agile CEO who is supporting the business and is part of a profit center and is part of making things work. You're not just a cost of doing business in the old way. So part of this digital transformation is the organizational changes and the changes in responsibility of management as well. Um, Mark, if you haven't seen him, I, I hope he's presenting sometime this week. Um, just go look him up on, on YouTube. He's a really engaging presenter, and, he, and he's a very good writer as well. These books, his books are very entertainingly written, very amusing books. Um, he was CIO of Department of Homeland Security Immigration Naturalization Service for about five years. And when he was first introduced at a conference, like we have somebody from, Department, from the Homeland Security coming to talk to us, and it's like, that doesn't sound good, but he was amazing. Um, for some reason, a couple of years ago, his services weren't needed anymore. And um, he persuaded him to join AWS, where he's running around helping people. And, and he's writing a really good series of blog posts as well. So definitely somebody to follow. So there's a lot of things to unpack here. I don't have time to get into it. But you know, if you can't unblock this piece of the system, then you're always going to be struggling as you go through this transformation. So. Let's think about corporate culture. This is a quote from the part of the Netflix culture deck. Some of you know I was at Netflix until about five years ago. I was there for seven years, and this is one of Reed Hastings' favorite quotes. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Right? And they'll build a better ship than the one you had in mind. Right? That's, that's the unblocking of potential that happens if you have trust in an organization and you get everybody fired up to go. You have a clear goal. You have a purpose-driven organization, with, and you trust people to do the right thing. Yeah. So how does that really work? This is something from the Nordstrom culture, Jack. It says, after you boil everything else down, you can have these really long, complicated culture decks. They said they boiled it down to just one thing, and I think this was very insightful. Use good judgment in all situations. And this is interesting because if you think about the typical way that organizations try to get people to do things, you say, well, we have a process for that. And we're going to write down the process. We're going to have a run book, or we're going to have a way, or you know, some process cycle. There's all of these product, product release processes. Everyone has a process. And you follow the process. You don't need to use your judgment. Like when there's a little bit of judgment, are you following the process? But basically, the process tells you what to do next. And then every now and again, something goes wrong when you fall off the edge of the process. And you go like, well, what do I do now? Well, now you have to use your judgment to figure out what to do when the process doesn't cover that. And the problem is you've been systematically trained to not use your judgment because you get penalized for not following the process. So you reach this point where you say, well, I'm not sure if, this, if there's a process for that. And people tend to freeze because they've been trained to not use their judgment. And this is actually a really interesting thing. It's like by writing down and making everything process-oriented, we're actually de-skilling the work. And then every now and again, we go, you, you, know, you have to suddenly start thinking. 
And what, that transition is a difficult one. So think about how you can have less process in your organization, but you need guardrails. You need some big rules. Right? If you're doing a cloud transformation, you say, I have big rules about security, scalability, availability, but I don't care what language you write the thing in. I don't care what toolkit you use or which IDE you use. Right? But these are the ground rules that you cannot break the security, scalability, availability rules. Right? So that would be an architectural sort of Think about putting, you know, if you're, playing, if you're bowling, you put, you put the buffers in the, down, down the side of the, the bowling alley so you can't get out. Everything works. But I don't really care exactly how you throw the ball. There's some freedom in there. So there's a lot of things here where you want to have some basic, basic inviolate architectural rules. But people tend to over-specify, and they get into just writing all these processes down. And that freezes things that should be much more flexible. So that's one way to think about it. Let's look at the, the Netflix culture deck. Um, I was actually there when this was written down in an off-site. Um, there was the whole discussion, should we even release this? And it was a really interesting time to be there. But this is actually how Netflix runs itself, and I think they still do, as far as I know. I left a few years ago. But having a really clear sense of what your culture is is important. So that's, that's one question. How fractured is your culture? Do you have one culture? That's this values is what the value part. Or do you have lots of different pieces of culture across your organization? Think about culture as being the shared values, the shared understanding that you have across the whole organization. And really, with Netflix, it's down to freedom and responsibility. That's how they have a low process organization. They have a very clear idea of giving people context, but not micromanaging them. Highly aligned around an end goal, but very loosely coupled on how they get there. And then they have a few other things that are very disruptive and hard to copy. And this is another aspect of what Netflix does. It's actually incredibly hard to copy Netflix. And this is deliberate. Netflix keeps finding things that other people find hard to copy that work for them and doing more and more of this. So it's actually really difficult to, to copy what Netflix does, particularly their, their compensation policy. I don't think anyone has ever managed to copy it. But it gives them an advantage in their market. If you look at it, at Amazon, was so, so Netflix is solving for the case where it's a very focused company, right? I think Netflix is basically the global TV channel for the world. One thing, that's it. Not even every kind of TV channel. They're not trying to do sports and news. They're just trying to do TV and movies, TV shows and movies for the world. Amazon's the opposite. Amazon's trying to do everything, everywhere in the world. We have people really scattered uh, everywhere across the whole the globe, there's I, last number I remember is 575,000 people work for Amazon. You know, not just the AWS piece, the whole piece. This is huge. It's diverse. How do you manage an incredibly diverse organization? And I think the rules in here are more applicable to most enterprises. Most enterprises are diverse. They're global. They're trying to do lots of things in lots of markets with lots of kinds of people. Netflix is much more appropriate if you're a startup and you're trying to do one thing and you're trying to be the best people in the world at doing that one thing. Right? So there's a different optimization here. But customer obsession is the top thing at, at AWS. Everything we do, we tie back to the customer. The other things here are really the, the behaviors. So the, the real leadership principle is that these are the behaviors we value. And I can go to anybody that works for Amazon anywhere in the world and start talking about any one of these. I could pick, dive deep, or hire and develop the best, or think big. And that person would know what I was talking about. We'd have a common set of understanding to have a discussion. So this is how to scale a very rapidly growing, large, diverse organization by having these cultural norms and, and principles embedded into the organization. So think about how are you doing that in your organization. And this is not just written on a little you know, bit of cardboard that we give to people or something. This is the mechanism we use when we're hiring people. So hiring people, we evaluate them against these uh, leadership principles. When there's promotions, and when there's bonuses, and when there's reviews, all of these things, and then when we write product descriptions, and when we write product launches, and all these things, these phrases pop up everywhere through that whole process. So it's totally embedded in the daily work of everybody at Amazon. And that's kind of this, this sort of mission to be the most customer-focused company. So just to summarize on culture then, 
the best thing is to have a culture that's intentional. Don't let culture happen to you, right? If, you, if you've grown through acquisition, you probably have a different culture for each acquisition unless you've actually worked to integrate it. And you see this again where, where cultures, so most of the dysfunctional cultures which have a lot of infighting are caused because there isn't really a central idea of what this culture should be. It lets it get diverse, and, and, and diversity of culture is, is not really a culture at that point. You end up with warring tribes. The culture should also be appropriate. Don't try and copy Netflix's culture if you're a big multinational diverse organization. And don't, you know, and the, the Amazon culture may not be appropriate if you're a startup trying to get one thing done very, very, in a very focused way. But think, at the root of all of these cultures, I think judgment is a very important piece that if you optimize for judgment and how people exercise their judgment and have the right information, that that is the core thing that I think underlies all of the good cultures. Okay, so that was culture. Let's talk a bit about skills. Training compensation. Uh, people say, well, you know, I can't do cloud because I can't hire the right people with the right skills. But I think really, you cloud isn't that hard to learn. It's actually easier to learn than data center skills. Uh, because if you think about learning data center skills, you have to find a data center with a bunch of unused machinery in it that you can go and plug, play with. It's hard to find, it's hard to set up, it's complicated, and then you've tested just one, one variety of it. With the cloud, all you need is a web browser. And a little bit of time. There's a lot of free information out there. There's lots of training classes. It's actually easier to acquire cloud skills than, and, and technology skills in the cloud than it is anywhere else. So I think it makes sense to train existing stuff and get them up to speed. And you should fund Pathfinder teams to go figure out which sets of tools work for you in which ways. But one of the, the classic mistakes I've seen is companies say, well, every time I train somebody up, they leave, right? Because you know, someone down the road pays them a bit more, they're worth more in the market, so they leave. Well, OK, so if they're worth more in the market, why aren't you paying them more? You'd now hire them back for more than you would be um, paying for them. So, there's an interesting point here, and this is something that's quite hard for us. You know, maybe your HR department doesn't have a way of dealing with this, but think about what are you going to do to incent your employees to get trained? Do you give them a bonus or some stock options or something, or, or a little, you know, you can gamify it in one way or another, some recognition that says you have learned a new useful skill for the company, and we'd like you to stick around and thank you in some form, right? It may be gamified, or it may just may be you know, financial, or it might be stock options or something like that. But if you have that program in there, it incents people to keep reskilling themselves with the latest technology, and it help makes, gives them a reason to stick around after they've got trained up. So think about that. I've seen too many times where people are just get fed up that they're funding the training for all of the people around them, the other companies around them. And this book is quite disruptive. Um, this is a book, if you give it to your HR department, you will see their heads explode, probably. Uh, smoke coming out of their ears. Um, it's, it's an amazingly powerful book because it's about how to empower employees in, a, in, in the way that Netflix does. And this is the, one of the things that's extremely hard to copy. But there's some ideas in here that you can use, but you get to figure out um, kind of why, why this works and, and why is it that certain companies can do things other companies can't do? And, th and the techniques that, that Netflix pioneered here were basically um, similar to running, more like running a sports team. The analogy that Netflix uses is that they are running an Olympic team. They're trying to compete in the Olympics. So they have all the different kind of sports that they're trying to compete in, and they want to find the best person in the world, you know, in their country, I guess, for that sport. And they're prepared to pay whatever it takes to get the best people. So if you're up against Netflix in some market, you're up against the best people that Netflix could possibly find doing every point, in, in every position in those teams that they have. And you know, if you think about some whatever your favorite sport is, the best funded team in the league um, in, in the sport is hiring the best talent. And they're up against somebody that didn't do that you know, maybe they don't do as well. Here we see this. I like motor racing. I'm a bit involved. We, AWS recently started sponsoring Formula One motor racing, and I somehow managed to get involved in that. Um, we see Mercedes this year. They, they won the championship. They hired um, 
Lewis Hamilton. And he's earning, he's one of the highest paid sports people in the world. He's earning 20 million pounds a year for the next two years. Right? Million, tens of millions of pounds a year. Well, he wins championships. Right? He's, he's clearly the best driver in the world right now, driving a car which was not necessarily the fastest car in the world this year. You know, there was, you could argue that the Ferrari was slightly faster than the Mercedes most of this year, but he still won because he's just able to go, drive faster than just about anyone else. So what does it take if, you, if, you can, if you've got the best talent? That's, the te that's a, a talent strategy which most people can't take. But if you can do it, then you can win in your market. So that's skills. Let's look at organization. Um, yeah. A lot of people have projects. Historically, that's the way IT is being run. We'll form a team. We'll put them on a project. And you know, you'll spend the next nine months upgrading SAP to the latest version or something, whatever that project looks like. And then at the end of it, everyone runs away and wants to work on something different. And that's kind of rinse and repeat. Um, when you move to product teams, you get long-term product ownership. It says, you're going to live with this thing. For the, I mean, we'll move people around, but that team is going to live with this thing. You're going to make your ERP system slightly better every day. It's not a, I'm going to spend nine months working on a project that's defined at the beginning. It's just incremental improvements, continuous delivery. Those models change the way you think about it. They change the incentives for the teams. They say, if I'm going to live with the long-term decisions of this system, then I'm going to behave differently than if I get to go and work on a different project next year. That sense of ownership matters. Continuous delivery really is, is, is the radical new thing. And as I, if you remember from the beginning, when I opened, talking about the digital disruption, this is from waterfall annual releases to continuous delivery. That is the nature of the digital transformation. Another thing that is quite hard for people to grasp, but this is the way that a lot of people at the leading edge now run, is this idea that you run what you wrote. And this really comes out of the pace that you're running at. So if you're doing a release, a monthly release, you know, once a month you have a meeting with the operations people and you say, I've built this new thing, here's the new release, I'm going to explain to you how to run the new release, or however often that is, every few months. And that transfer of, of information is a key part of the waterfall cycle to go from development to operations. Now think if you're doing 10 releases a day of the same service, the same microservice. It's like, I'm not going to have 10 meetings with operations a day to explain what I did. It doesn't work. You have to own it yourself. And this is the, sort of the fundamental thing. At the speed we're running at, there isn't time to explain to somebody else the exact state of things, how to manage it. So the, the person that should be frontline on call for a service should probably be the last person to check code into it. Right. So if you, if you check code, you're on call, maybe there'd be a race to not be the last person at the end of the day to check code in. But what we found when we did this was that all of a sudden, developers discovered they could write reliable code that didn't break at 3 AM, especially if they'd, after they'd been woken up at 3 AM a few times. They also discovered automatically, without being told, that it wasn't a good idea to ship new things on Fridays or sort of after 3 PM in the afternoon. So they built their own, these, these, you know, apply the pain to where it can do the most good is really one way of thinking about this. Now, there's, there's a whole bunch of things here, but this is the way Netflix works, the way AWS works, or Amazon in general works. And a lot of the leading companies in the industry, the people that really are running quickly, are running in this mode. And you know, it's hard to, hard to go through the transition to this, because a lot of people say, hey, I didn't become a developer to be on call. And it says, well, so who else is, who's supposed to be on call for your you know, bad decisions that you made or that code you decided to put out there? So, it's, it's good for people to take responsibility for their own work. The other thing about this is it reduces tech debt and lock-in. And I could go on, on about this a lot. Um, I have a whole separate presentation about this. But if you think about a project, a project is a mechanism for creating lock-in. The point where you transfer it from development to operations is where you turn the key in the lock, and you froze all the decisions you made. And you are now stuck with that database, that message queue system, that hardware, whatever you did, right? Because changing it requires a whole new project. That's the difference. 
Now, when you're on continuously changing a project, a, a product, that product ownership thing where you're continuously delivering, you, you never actually turn the key in the lock. You know, I want to change the database for this particular microservice. I can just go and do that. I'll put it in my sort of burn down for the next agile sprint or whatever you want to call it. You know, and a few weeks later, you've moved from you know, SQL Server to MySQL or whatever it is you want it to do, or Oracle to Postgres or something. Right? It's an incremental design decision that you're just retiring little bits of technical debt from time to time, and you're not getting into this whole lock-in. So it's more incremental. It's more fine grain. So think of it as um, instead of basically enterprise monolithic lock-in being the way we used to deal with this. It's now basically continuous micro-refactoring, micro-dependency management. That's really what we're looking at. And that really changes the way you think about what does it take, what, what, what is the cost of making a decision that I'm going to use this piece of technology? Well, previously, you'd run a POC, you'd talk to a vendor, you'd spend maybe a million dollars checking that everything works and sign a deal, or maybe a deal will get signed on some golf course somewhere, and you know, some sales rep will be super happy for a few months. And nowadays, you download some code from GitHub, and you tinker with it, or you fire up a, a web service on a cloud provider like AWS, and you go, OK, yeah, that works for now. And then a few months later, you decide to switch to something else, and you, you do that. So the, the cost of getting into the decision is very low. The cost of operating it and changing the decision is very low. So it, this micro-dependency management really turns into the new way you should think about it. So what that means is you shouldn't spend a huge amount of time up front trying to decide what technologies you should be using. You should just let it evolve. The best architectures now are designed to evolve continuously, not be some perfect, fixed-in-time, best-in-class kind of thing. The best-in-class means it's designed to evolve, OK? So a couple of good books here, um, lots of them by Gene Kim and others. But the Phoenix Project, hopefully most of you have read that. It's a story about a company reinventing itself, moving from this sort of dysfunctional model to a much more DevOps-based model. And the DevOps handbook, lots and lots of details of how to do that. So I think this transition is a key piece of it. And people, it takes a while to get through. It's not something you can do immediately. But it's, it's the biggest difference between companies that are going fast and companies that are going slow. So that's that. So CapEx versus OpEx. Now, so who defines your technology architecture? Is it your CTO or is it the CFO? All right. And the problem is, in a lot of organizations, it goes like, no, the CFO says, well, I like all this capitalization stuff, so uh, I, can, I know how to capitalize a data center. But as soon as you start put, moving large amounts of dollar investment to cloud, I, it's all expense. So how do I deal with that? And the other thing is, when you go from, um, if you're doing development and operations, right, development OK, I can capitalize that because that's, some, that's an asset once I finish developing it. Then I'm going to operate it, and that's an expense. So when I'm doing DevOps, they go, hey, where did I draw the boundary? You have to find new ways. So both of these things, both the move to DevOps and the move to cloud, both take away opportunities for the traditional way that you capitalize your, your, your investments. And they move more to expense. And while you're doing it a little bit on the side and no one notices, you're fine. And at some point during your cloud transition, you start hitting a substantial proportion of your IT infrastructure moves to AWS. That's typically when the CFO wakes up because next quarter's a bidder looks wrong. <laughs> right? And we've seen this at multiple customers. You either, you either run into this brick wall or you haven't. I'm just telling you it's there because one day you'll be at like 10, 20% of your IT will, hit, will be cloud spend. And you'll be going, oh, yeah, I remember that. I should have told, talked to the CFO and planned it in somehow or figured out how to operate, operationalize this transition so that it makes sense. OK. So those are the things I see blocking people or slowing people down. Let's look at the, the pathway. How do we get there? The first thing we optimize for is speed. And then we go to scale. And then we start talking about strategic workloads. For speed. Optimize for time to value. How fast can you get something simple done? And there's lots of simple things you want to get done. Going back to Mark Schwartz, his uh, Department of Homeland Security, if he wanted to change anything at all on the DHS website, 
he, it was a one-year-long process with a hundred and something documents, like to change the color of one pixel, right, on the, or change the spelling of one word on the website. It was the only process they had was a, a mandated year-long waterfall process. And it was built for very good reasons, but it was not meeting the need. You should be able to do simple things quickly. If you can't do simple things quickly, you won't be able to do complicated things quickly either. So the first thing I would, I would do in a transition is make sure that if you want to make a small change, that you have a process as light, you, you've figured out a lightweight process for doing that small change. Right? The next thing that happens is you start rebuilding your applications, maybe these new class of applications, the sort of IoT backend, mobile backend, uh, large-scale data science systems, your new data lake. These are the projects which are net new greenfield type applications that are built cloud native. They're built to scale. They're built to design to operate in the cloud. And then what happens is some of your data centers come up for replacement or, um, or they're in the wrong place or something like that. And you go, well, instead of building a new data center, and thinking, maybe I should just open a cloud account. And you kind of look at the combination of what do I get if I open a AWS account versus spending you know, tens of millions of dollars on a, on a building and filling it with equipment. And how long does it take and how hard is it? And what, product, what services do I get in that data center? Even the best built data centers now, it's really hard to compete with the large scale cloud providers. We've just got too much investment. We know how to do this. We're productizing this. It's become a commodity, but the commodity is vastly better than the thing you can build yourself. And that transition is starting to bite, and more and more people now are moving critical workloads out of their data centers to cloud. So I'll talk a bit about that, that phase as well. So time to value. This is a, a, an interesting statistic that comes from the Accelerate book. Uh, my Nicole Forsgren, Des Humble, and Gene Kim. The fast companies are 440 times faster than the slow companies. Right, that's, what they did was they've been surveying them. They're now up to, I think, the fifth year of running this survey. And they're looking at it, and they're clustering. And they're saying, OK, how long does it take you to do everything? And they're saying, some people take months, and other people take hours to do the same thing. So when you cluster these organizations, a high-performing organization was 46 times more frequent deploys, but 440 times faster lead time. That's the latency, commit to deploy. And I think this is the one metric I would focus on. Everything, if this metric is good, everything else gets good. You could, some people focus on the frequency of deployments, but what it, I think if you focus on latency, it naturally will lead you to releasing lots of small chunks of update which are safer, they, they release things better, you get functionality out more quickly that way. Mean time to recover from downtime as well. That's, that's vastly better. And the rate at which things change, uh, fail, is lower. So this, was, this is what's in the book. And it means that something, you know, people in the same business, by the way, this does not depend on whether you're a government or a a uh, large organization or a startup, there are slow startups, there are slow governments, there are slow big companies, and there are fast governments, fast, fast big companies, and fast startups. It's, it is actually cuts across everything. It's much more about how you internally decide to organize than the actual type of business you're in. So this is a really profound thing. It's amazing that you can be faster, cheaper, and safer all at once by a large factor. And it, it's staggering, except it's based on real research. Nicole has done lots of presentations around the world recently, so you should go look for Nicole Forsgren and find, find a video of one of her talks. So, but in case that wasn't bad enough for the slow companies, the last update that they did since this book came out, the, there's now a new group of elite companies that are 2,500 two times faster instead of only 440 times faster. You know, so these are people that are doing stuff in minutes instead of months. Right? And they've emerged as a separate cluster. So this is, this is you know, it's, if you stay still, you're going to fall behind them. It, maybe you don't need to do things in minutes, but if you can, think of what it unblocks. And you see we've got faster time to recover from downtime as well. So amazing uh, differences. And again, if you, if you want to measure one thing in your organization, measure your commit to deploy latency. That's the time to value. 
measure that one thing, publish it, and when, the, when you see the survey come around once a year from, from Nicole, go enter your data about your company in there, and that way you're becoming part of this cohort of, of organizations that's tracking their improvements. You can also do leaderboards across different teams in your group to see what is your commit to deploy, and you know, reward people for gradually taking another meeting out of the deploy cycle or taking another ticket out, because you know, there's one company I was talking to recently said they had 50 tickets per deploy, and that's why it took two months or three months. And, you know, um, the fast companies, it's one ticket, and it's a tracking ticket, and it records that the deploy happened and everything about it. But, you know, the approval process is sort of baked into the fact that the person deploying it is going to be on call for the thing that they just did, and it's a tiny change. So that's time to value, and you will get the speed you need if you can concentrate on improving time to value. Next thing, distribute optimized capacity. This is highly scaled applications that are distributed across multiple cloud regions for availability, cost optimized, high utilization. And this is really interesting. And when you're doing small things quickly, the utilization isn't really a big deal. You're not spending that much on, on a fast change or a small, a small project. But these are large scale systems and you want to run very high utilization. So this is the point at which people that just throw stuff into the cloud say, yeah, it costs more in the cloud. But your utilization should be many times higher. A typical data center utilization, you're doing well if you're giving better than 10% utilized. In the cloud, you should be aiming for, I don't know, four times that, five times that. If you can be 40% utilized on average instead of 10%, you're running on a quarter of the number of machines on average. So say, let's say you have 1,000 machines in the data center. Your average number of machines, if you could increase that utilization to 40% from 10%, would be 250 machines. So you're running on an average of 250 machines in the cloud. And then maybe at some points in the cloud, you have 2,000 machines, but only for very short periods of time. And then as soon as they get idle, you shut them off again. So one of the key things about the uh, cloud native architectures is they're extremely elastic. And we just, uh, just a week or so ago, we announced a new autoscaler optimization where there's a machine learning model built into the autoscaler which will predictively model the system and scale you up and down automatically, taking into account your growth, your, your growth rate, all of the other factors. Is it a holiday? You know, all of those things. Because right? your scaling model looks different on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day than it does on normal days as we found out. It turns out, you know, one of, one of the New Year's days at Netflix in the early days, we're all there sitting around slightly hungover like you normally are, trying to watch TV and wondering why the website's going absolutely crazy because that's what everyone else is doing as well. There's really nothing else to do on, on New Year's Day except watch Netflix, it turns out. Um, but it surprised us at the time. So let's look at this cloud-native architecture. These are the principles. It's pay as you go, and it's pay after you've used the resource. Right? That's the standard thing. You look, tot up how much you've used, and you, know, you still have to predict and manage a little bit on your budgets, but paying afterwards is much better than trying to guess in advance how much capacity you're going to need for something in the next few months. Self-service with no waiting, API-driven requests to get everything. Right? Every time you put a ticket in there or make somebody go and have a meeting about getting something done, you're slowing things down. So pull those out, make it self-service, make, make it API-driven. Build The layers of platform you build on top of this should be API-driven as well. Globally distributed by default. There's no difference for me starting machine in Singapore or Paris or London or the UK or London or, or, or Virginia. It's just a different pop-down, you know, it's a pull-down on a menu. It's a different word in an API call, right? You don't have to go and build a, find a team of people and hire them in, in Sao Paulo in order to have a machine there. That, that's a radically different way of thinking about where you situate your resources, because it's really difficult and expensive to keep launching new data, creating new data centers in new countries if you're a big organization. But it, we're doing all that hard work for you. The availability models go to cross zone and cross region, so understanding those in detail rather than having individual data centers with failover. I, I did a talk uh, this morning on um, chaos engineering where we talked quite a lot about this, this aspect of the change. Um, 
And this really high root utilization, you should, every time the machine goes idle or drops below you know, 30, 40% busy, you should be turning it off and the, make, you know, assuming you've got sort of a horizontally scaled application. And your code deployments are immutable. You, you, you deploy new code alongside the old code. And once the old traffic to the old code goes away, you delete those machines, and you just keep doing that. This sort of uh, you know, red-black pushes or blue-green pushes, whatever you want to call it, this, this way of deploying is a radically different way because it means you never update something in place. And that means you don't have the version drift, and I'm not quite sure if that update completed the same way. All the machines are identical. They're baked to be the same. And that can be done with instances or with containers or with Lambda functions as well. OK, so that's distribute optimized capacity. And let's talk a bit about these critical workloads. Um, you can't legislate against failure. What that means is you can't predict everything that could go wrong, but you can get really good at detecting it quickly and responding quickly. And Chris Pinkham built the first version of EC2. This is the way that uh, AWS and Amazon has been running for a long time, and the way that uh, a lot of the uh, other leading organizations are. That's why. Some organizations are just really fast at getting things done. Well, let's think about people training. This is usually the point at which the fire alarm goes off and everyone has to leave the room uh, when I give this talk. But you've all been there, right? You've all worked somewhere where you had to go stand in the parking lot for a while <laughs> just because you know, we have to test the fire alarm. And if you go around the world and look at elevators, they all have a little sign on them that says, in the event of fire, do not use the elevator. And when there really is a fire, you don't see lines of people standing at the elevators staring, you know, going, well, I wonder if we should really do that or not, right? We've managed to systematically uh, train pretty much the world's population on how to handle high-rise buildings, right? And how to handle fire in a building because it's such a present problem. It happens. It happens often enough people care about it. And we've unified the, the fire drill globally. So, Really, a really nice example there of uh, it saves lives to have training in how to, how to manage incidents, right? So who's running the fire drill for IT in your organization? Right? You've got all of these things that could go wrong. The people don't know what to do once, there's an, once something fails. The application keels over every time it sees a, a, an error message it wasn't expecting. You're switching, you know, the, the switches you put in to handle the traffic Rerouting, you don't test them very often, so they keel over every time you try and test them. And the infrastructure underneath you isn't redundant enough, or you don't have enough, enough of it to, to switch over. So this is where the chaos engineering team comes in. As I said, there was a talk on this this morning. You can go find that. Um, the chaos engineering team will ensure that you have experienced staff. They've been on calls. They know what to do. They know how to get to the dashboard that tells them which parts of the system are up and healthy. They know how to log into those dashboards. They, they know how to behave on an incident call because there's a set of behaviors there for getting stuff done quickly. And if you don't know that, you can drag it out and waste time doing root cause analysis, which should be done asynchronously and later. There's a lot of things here that you can train for just doing getting people up to speed. So this is quite often called. Um, game days, right? So you, you, have, you practice having outages. You practice having people uh, go through the failure processes. So you want experienced stuff. You want robust applications where you've thrown a bunch of random errors at it to make sure it doesn't just fall over. And you know what happens if it gets a slow response and how its timeouts and failovers and retries work. You want your switching fabric to be more dependable than the system it's switching between. The really critical point here. When you're building a highly available system with a switch in it, the switch must be order of magnitude more reliable than the things it's switching between, or you're better off having a single system with no switch, because that switch will actually cause more problems than the system you're trying to save from. And this is one of those principles of reliability engineering that people seem to overlook too little to bit too often. And you want to have redundant service foundation, lots and lots of copies of this. So what's happening now is this expensive and custom disaster recovery, the sort of DR failover to data centers, between data centers being replaced by low-cost, portable, and automated chaos engineering principles. And lo lots more to talk about on that. But from this point of view, I think that is, that's where we are right now. 
spending a lot of time right now working with customers who've decided that they want to move all into cloud, and how do they do that? And, you know, several reasons why this is happening now. One is data center replacement. They're just looking, you know, it just makes more sense. Others, they're looking at what's in their data sets and saying, you know what? I can't find any millennial COBOL programmers and IBM mainframe operators. Uh, they're all retiring out of, you know, I've got maybe five, 10 years before the, my, the, the people that know how to run this stuff are gonna retire, and there's just not really people coming along that care about this stuff. Um, some of the old legacy, I, some, one of, you know, you know, some of you know I used to work at Sun, they're so we've got to retire these old Solaris machines, right? <laughs> I used to be probably involved in helping install those old Solaris machines like 10 or 20 years ago, but anyway. Um, this technology is just becoming obsolete, and the cloud is becoming a better and better place to put things, so we're now getting into really safety and business critical applications that if they fail or, and they don't behave correctly when incidents happen, the companies could go out of business or lose enormous amounts of money, people could get hurt, you know, there's, there's applications in healthcare, industrial control, machinery, all kinds of things. That, and we're figuring out how do we manage this in the cloud and how do, we, how do we do it right? So lots of interesting work there. If you're working in any of those highly critical industries, I'm very interested to contact me personally, really interested in um, figuring out how we can help make sure we have all the right things we need to make you successful. So that's it. Thank you very much. We've got a bit of time for questions. Thank you.